This is a presentation of One Login Training. Welcome to the final video of how to get started with One Login Workforce Identity. So now that we know how to automatically go and create the users in the applications, we can go and enable SSO. One of the most popular single sign-on authentication methods is SAML. Most of the steps to configure SAML are actually done over on the application's end. So again, documentation is your friend. Either one logins documentation or the application's documentation. The only step you might want to perform on the one login end is create a new certificate to use for that X509 cert. You can do so by going to the certificate option underneath the security menu. You want to create a cert using at minimum SHA-256 and expires one or two years. The rest of the information that we see here on this single sign or SSO tab is really used for references purposes. You need the information to complete whatever the configuration steps are over on the application's end. In addition to, again, possibly having to create a new cert for the single sign-on configuration within one login, you might also want to go take a look at some of those parameters. So we talked about parameters when we were looking into configuring provisioning. Well, parameters are also sent across as part of SAML. So again, if there are different values that you want to map over, you would want to go over to the parameters tab to go change what the mappings are here. Usually the required parameters are going to be the ones that are sent across in SAML. So it depends upon the app connector as to whether they're really called out as required parameters or not. But those are the ones that are usually sent across as part of SAML. So let's go finish up configuring the app connector we already did the provisioning for by now configuring the single sign-on using SAML. So we know provisioning works for our Salesforce app connector. Let's go finish off configuring it by enabling SAML. So we'll go back to the one that we were already working with. Again, for basic SAML configuration, I would also, by the way, need the Salesforce login URL, but not a lot of other changes that I need over on the one login end. Now I might want to go to the SSO tab and make sure that whatever certificate that I'm using here is at minimum SHA-256 and expires within a year or two. So I can go and create new certificates by going to the security menu up here, click certificates, click new, and then choose, you know, we'll do this SHA-256 uh, and we'll call this the two year one. And key length, we're good. We can go longer if we want to. Somewhat depends upon the applications as to how long the key length can be and what's supported on its end. At minimum, again, we'll want SHA-256. Again, might depend upon the application as to what they'll support for the signature, but usually want one that's gonna expire in one to two years and we're gonna click save. So if we wanted to use this certificate that we just created for our Salesforce connection, then we can go to the SSO tab, click change and choose the new cert from here. But I'm gonna stick to the one year one that I was already using cause it's already set up. So this SSO tab, so other than possibly changing the certificate, SSO tab, most part, used as reference. So most of the steps in this case are really done over on the Salesforce end, which really means that configuring SAML is gonna differ depending upon the application. How many times I have to say that? I do not know. So for Salesforce, I would quickly get to like the single sign-on settings over here in Salesforce. And I need to check this little checkbox here to say SAML is enabled. I need to create a new configuration. Type in little one login here. This issuer 
this URL, it's right here, is the issuer URL that we use over here. So just copy it from here, paste it into this issuer text box. The identity provider certificate would actually be, if I click on view details here, I can download the certificate from here and then upload it over here. Okay. And the only other changes I'll want to make are going to be something like here. I'm going to need the API name is one login. Entity ID is always SAML salesforce.com. So that's not very complicated. And I want this identity provider login URL. So this guy is actually, let's go back to the app connector. Sad when my back button doesn't want to work very quickly. So I'm just going to go this way. Is this SAML 2.0. So SAML 2.0 endpoint URL gets copied and pasted in this case in the identity provider login URL. And if you want like automatic logout, like when they log out of Salesforce, please log me out of one login, then you'd fill out the logout URL. So copy and paste this SLO for single logout <laughs> endpoint, take that URL, copy and paste it over into the custom logout URL. So again, what these steps exactly look like are going to differ depending upon the application. In general, you're going to want to use that SAML 2.0 endpoint. You're going to need the certificate and or you're going to need the issuer URL and the certificate. In the case of Salesforce, you want both the issuer URL and the SAML 2.0 URLs and the certificate. So some sort of combination. Always need the certificate, basically. Sometimes it's a matter of not downloading the certificate, but actually like copying and pasting all this fun stuff, including the begin certificate and end certificate part, into like a text field over in the application. In the case of our friend Salesforce, I download it and I upload it. So again, those exact steps, somewhat different depending upon the application. But once I've set that up, again, through the application, now my users can log in automatically using SAML. Though we have thousands of pre-built app connector, there are definitely times when you have an app you want to integrate with and we won't have a pre-built connector for it. So what do you do? Well, <laughs> kind of depends upon the authentication method and whether you want provisioning support or not. So which connector you use depends upon your needs. First, figure out the authentication method or methods that the application actually supports. Now we talked about forms authentication, not the best choice. So if you have a choice and the app supports SAML, go for SAML or OIDC. SAML or OIDC are gonna be better than forms, okay? Forms, we have this generic connector for SAML. There's what's called SAML test connector and the OIDC has an OIDC connector. Also, in some cases for like the forms authentication stuff, the generic one doesn't really work, especially if for that forms authentication, remember that's the one where you're passing in a username and password actually into the application. Uh, maybe it's got multiple forms, like username gets passed on one, then it's submitted, then there's a password that needs to be sent in. Then you might actually need to use what we call our custom connector. And depending upon how complex it is, you might actually need support help to help you with it. Now, as far as what else can you do, again, <laughs> that's the only one where you really might need some support help. The rest of them you should be able to configure on your own. But if you want to also do provisioning on top of 
single sign-on to an application that we do not have a pre-built connector for, then we've got a couple of options. We have some skim connectors. So we have several skim connectors that you can choose from. I'll support SAML and provisioning if the application supports skim, which is basically a standard for handling, creating users and updating users. If the application doesn't support skim, then we nowadays actually have what we call our universal provisioning connector. So it's a little add-on kind of piece, but you can talk to your account manager, your account exec, go for the universal provisioning connector and we can connect you up. So, but let's look at some of the simpler options that are out there. So first, the generic connector. Again, this is used if the application only supports forms, basically. And again, we do not have an app connector to fit your needs. So you would use the generic connector. Just go add app, search for generic. This guy will pop up. Pretty simple to configure. You need the login URL. So very similar steps to configuring actual form app what's login URL, and decide who's providing the credentials. Is it the users themselves? Is it the admin who's providing it? Or is this a case where everybody's gonna share the same set of credentials? Now, for those applications that support SAML, again, can't use one of our out-of-box connectors, then you want to search for the SAML test connector. Technically, it's called SAML test connector advanced. So, might be a little tricky. Again, not one of our app connectors that we have out of the box. So you're gonna to have to look at the documentation for the application itself to kind of help you out there as to how it needs to be filled out. But at minimum, what you need to fill in are those ACS fields. And there are actually two of them. So there's the ACS consumer URL which would be similar to kind of that like login page, identity fine page that you might have specified for one of our regular app connectors when configuring SAML. But you'll need to figure out what that is for the application, should be in their documentation. And you need the same URL, but with some little regex in it. So just need some escape characters in front of the forward slashes and things like that, and a little dollar sign to show that the thing's ending and such. So <clears throat> fill in basically the two ACS fields. It's the same URL. Just need a few little escape characters and such for the URL validator there. So configuration tab, again, minimum, fill in those two fields. Might need more depending upon the application. Look at documentation. And then go over to the SSO tab. And again, SSO tab, mainly used for references purposes. So what you do with this information will depend upon the application. Typically at minimum, need something like that SAML 2.0 endpoint. And for you to download whatever the cert is that you specified for the X509 cert up there. And finally, <coughs> necessary go and modify the parameters that are being sent out. Again, the main identifying value is gonna be the one that you're most concerned with, but the application might support other parameters and you can certainly add them in here. And then again, match them up to existing user fields in one login. Now for OIDC type, you're gonna need that client certificate over on the applications end again and whatever the issuer URL is. Now, again, the rest of the options here, what application type you're choosing, authentication method, et cetera, those are going to be specific to the application. So go check out its documentation. <laughs> Cannot stress that enough. Now, before we actually assign our users to the applications, we might want to think about whether we need any additional security measures. So that's where our app policies come into play. We mentioned app policies way back in the last module when we were talking about user policies. This is where we're gonna take a little deeper look at them. 
So app policies, again, somewhat like the user policies, but much simpler in their design. And they're basically gonna control whether a user is gonna be prompted, say for MFA again, before they access an application, or maybe restrict them so they're only allowed to log into this particular application if they are coming from a secured network, like they have to be on the internal corporate network or connected through a VPN. So the app policies are created the same way the user policies are. I'm gonna to go to security menu policies. I'm just gonna click on the new app policy button instead of new user policy button and notice very simple in its little design. <laughs> so I can specify IP addresses here I want to allow. Down there at the bottom, specify whether I want to require MFA. And I can even do a little tweaking. So I can force authentication or skip MFA. If it is required for them, maybe skip it if it was required in the user policy. And I even have the ability to enable smart access here at the application level. Remember we talked about smart access when we talked about that smart factor and all of its fun features that come with it. And smart access is the one that looks at a user's behavior when they're logging in, location, time, machine they're coming from, etc., and compares that behavior to a norm that's established for that user over time and basically gives it a risk score. Zero to five means it's pretty much like normal behavior. And up towards 100 means, wow, this is really, really different behavior than that user normally does. So you could say, well, basically for smart access, deny access if that behavior is really different than that user's normal behavior. Okay, so low there, it's like 25 and above. Medium would be like 50 above. High is like 75 and above, approximately around there. So um, you might not want to deny them all the time. So low would tend to totally deny them access a good chunk of the time. Uh, high would really be denying access if it's like totally somebody from a different country, different machine, different browser, different type of day, like really, really going against the norm for this user. So you can kind of choose that tolerance level there with the risk level option. So again, policies are applied to applications. So they're set on an app connector level. So you go to the access tab of the app policy. And for example, here I might want to apply everybody a policy so that they're prompted for MFA before they come to the Salesforce app. So I would choose an app policy that requires MFA from that dropdown. I can also apply app policy to a subset of users that are accessing the application. So for example, I might have an app policy against my AWS app connector. But instead of it applying to all different types of users, whether they're full-time users, part-time users, contractors, or even our friend Jim Patterson there, who've been assigned to this application, maybe I only want the app policy to apply to my contractors. So I can actually do that. It's called role-based app policy. So, Apply it, same place, access tab on the app connector, but I'm just gonna go add in a role-based rule there and I'm gonna say anybody, in this case, the engineering role and assign them a particular app policy. Remember roles, I've mentioned this before and we're gonna take a look at this real shortly, but roles are used to assign applications to users. So in this case, we're also looking that Salesforce has been assigned to anybody in an SP role that we've created, the all employees role and the engineering role. But only those who are in the engineering role are going to have this particular app policy applied to them. So again, we looked at user policies don't get them confused with app policies. 
user policies apply before users even get into one login for the most part. Right, they're the ones that are determining password complexity requirements, whether MFA is required just to get into the portal, what IP addresses you're required to come from just to get into the portal. Once you get into the portal there, then it might or might not also have some session timeout settings, again, defined within the user policy. But app policies, you see over there towards the right, they're like extra hoops that a user has to jump through in order to get access to that particular application. So my user has gotten into the portal. It's kind of like they've gotten into the castle, but now they need to get into a specific room within the castle. So we've got extra guards in front of that room. And we're gonna prompt our user for additional authentication or identity information before they can get access into that room, or in this case, that application. That's what app policies are for. Whew. Finally, now we've gone through what's necessary to configure the app connector, we can finally assign it to our users or assign it to roles, put our users in the roles. Remember, kind of like we created user policies, associated the policy with a group and assigned the user to a group. Roles here, though, are much more fun. They're more flexible. Users can belong to more than one role, unlike those groups. So roles, again, used to assign users to application. I can assign multiple users to a role. I can associate multiple applications with that role. Thus, every user in the role is assigned to that application. I can have a single application be assigned to multiple roles, by the way, <laughs> and I can have a single user be assigned to multiple roles. So it's a many to many relationship in this game. So how you design it, up to you. You might have something like an all employees role that has all the applications all your users need. And then maybe specific applications that are kind of associated more with particular departments. So then you create department level roles like we see here, sales, marketing, operations, engineering. And notice, again, what did I say? Same application, same app connector can belong to more than one role. In fact, we see Salesforce here as part of the sales role as well as the marketing role. Or AWS is over there underneath operations and engineering. Okay. You have flexibility, however you might want to do it. You might simply create a single role for every application. Some cases that works out quite nicely, especially if there's you need to enable provisioning for those applications because you want to control really when users are sent, assigned to the apps and which users are assigned to those apps. So you create one role, create, add the app to that role and simply assign the users to the role when necessary. So again, best type practices, if it makes sense, maybe match to departments or teams, but only put in applications that don't have provisioning enabled for them. For applications that do have provisioning, put them in their own roles. Again, makes it much easier to control rolling out all that provisioning stuff as well and helps with the licensing issues. So guess what? We'll go create a couple of roles. All right, so let's go to our users menu, create a role, users roles. I wanna click new role. So this account already has roles for the big apps like Salesforce and Office 365. So we'll just create one for FedEx here. Give it a handy dandy name like FedEx. Select the app we're associating it with and click save. There you go, create a role. Once you have roles, you can assign the users manually from the application tab. So go to the user record, click on applications. All the roles that you have created are gonna be listed on the left-hand side. Just cause you see them listed does not mean that user was assigned to that role. Be careful. 
You might make that assumption. That's a bad assumption. <laughs> okay. If a user is assigned to a role manually, you will see a green check mark. How do you assign it to it, the user to it manually? Just click on it. Click on it, click save. Even more better is to assign them automatically. How can we assign users to roles automatically? Mappings! Remember the mappings that we use to assign a user to a group? Well, we can use those same mappings to assign users to roles. Again, they only work if that user information is accurate and up to date. <laughs> so let's go assign some users to our roles. Finally, we want to go assign some of these apps to our users. So again, we've seen how we can manually assign the apps, but we're gonna use roles at this point. So if I go to a user directly, like Miss DDoS over here, and I go to applications, I will see all the roles that currently exist over on the left-hand side, and I can manually assign the user to a role by selecting it and then clicking save. So do not be fooled simply because roles are listed over here on the left hand side does not mean the user belongs to it. You need some sort of visual to confirm that. The check mark means that they were manually assigned to the role and now I can see that the app associated with that role has been assigned to them automatically assigning to a role, even mo better, is going to go to mappings. So let's create a mapping here and we'll just assign this to everyone. We can do something like this. Let's take everybody's email address and if it contains the company's SMTP domain like demo.com, go assign them to that FedEx role. Click save. Now again, does this mean that it's gone and assigned it to all my users? No, it's a brand new mapping. Mappings only fire off when users are created or updated. Therefore, I need to manually apply it. So I'm gonna say reapply all mappings. Again, Depending upon number of users, number of mappings might take a while. Don't have a whole bunch of users, don't have a whole bunch of mapping, so it shouldn't take all that long. We can go see it over here. Let's refresh a little bit and it's already complete. All right, so now let's go check out our users. And in fact, we see FedEx listed here <laughs> as one of the roles that everybody belongs to, but if we go and look at applications, we can also see FedEx over here, it's been automatically assigned. The visual to confirm that is it sort of grayed out, got those double arrows on it. If you hover over it, it says it was assigned via mapping and you cannot undo that. And we see FedEx has been assigned to the user. So once you have the application fully configured, configured provisioning, if necessary, configuring the single sign-on authentication process, any policies, app policies, more security you want to apply to it, all of those pieces, once you have that set up, then you can assign the applications to the users. And ta-da, everybody can access the applications they need. So now we've basically completed all three major steps. Got our users in one login. We made sure that they could log into one login securely. Those great user policies. And now we started configuring our app connectors, both provisioning as well as single sign-on. Sign the users to the apps. They can start logging in. This concludes the last part of how to get started with one login workforce identity. This is a presentation of One Login Training.